Hello. So this video is going to talk about Aristophanes' play Thesmophora Susia, which, uh, for the sake of not having to try and say that word repeatedly, uh, I'm going to refer to as Women of the Festival, uh, which is one of the English translations of the title. Uh, more properly, uh, a translation would probably be Women of the Thesmophoria, which was a religious festival for women specifically uh, in ancient Athens, honoring Demeter and uh, Persephone, who were uh, deities of uh, harvests, deities of domesticity, uh, of bounty, things like this. So the play is a deeply metatheatrical play, um, in part because Euripides is a central character. Euripides obviously being one of the, the major playwrights uh, whose work survives to, to today, uh, in addition to Aristophanes himself. Um, Euripides has something of a reputation for being, we'll say, edgy. Uh, there's a lot of sort of cynicism about the gods in Aristophanes' play. There's a lot of critique of social values, social norms, things like this. Um, and Women of the Festival primarily focuses on Aris, uh, our, sorry, on Euripides' uh, tendency to portray women rather negatively. Um, so we get a lot of uh, Euripides' plays where women don't necessarily come off all that well, though we also get some plays where they do come off well. And so, uh, but this is one of the the debates about Euripides' work is what the role of women in his plays is. So what happens in uh, Aristophanes' play is that the women at the Thesmophora decide that they're going to have a trial of Euripides, more or less a trial of Euripides, um, mostly they've pretty much already decided that he's guilty. Um, and so they're going to, really, they're, they're trying to decide what to do to punish him for his negative portrayals of women. And so because Euripides is a central figure, we actually get a lot of meta-theatrical elements here. Um, so Euripides... Uh, originally tries to convince this other tragic poet, uh, Agathon, to disguise himself as a woman and go into the Thesmophora and speak on Euripides' behalf. Uh, Agathon declines the invitation, uh, at which point Euripides' cousin, uh, Nasilicus, says that he will take on uh, the mission. He will be disguised as a woman and will go in uh, and and try and plead Euripides' case. So, uh, Euripides uh, shaves Nasilicus and singes him, which I'm, I'm not from the text 100% clear what that means, so uh, I'm probably going to watch uh, some, some versions of this on YouTube and try and figure out what this is. Um, it seems like he singes the sort of lower back region, so I'm not... Maybe it's like waxing, but I, I, I'm not 100% sure on this. Uh, and then he dresses Nasilicus up in uh, yellow silk, a yellow silk dress with a girdle and all this stuff, and sends him in. Um... So we've already got that element of costuming, of creating a character, things like this, uh, which is itself meta-theatrical. But 
there's one interesting sort of short bit here that I, I want to just read you very quickly. Um, Agathon, when he's sort of explaining that he's not going to go undercover for Euripides, says, Expect me not to bear your burdens, that were foolishness indeed. Each man must bear his sorrows for himself, and troubles when they come must needs be met by manful acts and not by shifty tricks. So, this is... So, Agathon's a, 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 a tragic poet. And... So this is an interesting sort of theory of tragedy with this idea that, like, everyone has to uh, bear up under their fate. Because like, the idea of fate, uh, the idea of uh, destiny and the inability to escape what the fates have allotted you is really central to tragedy. So we've got, I like that, that sort of passing reference to a tragic philosophy there. But, um, so Nasolicus goes in and uh, very predictably gets caught. Actually, he gets caught after uh, another character. Um, Yeah, sorry. Uh, after another character comes in and says, hey, Euripides has sent his cousin undercover. So they catch Nasilicus and they hold him because men are not allowed at the Thesmophora uh, and he's he's violated that rule. So they send for the police um, and Nasilicus had gotten Euripides to promise that if anything went wrong, Euripides would come rescue him. What Nasilicus tries to do to get this sort of message to Euripides and facilitate his escape is basically uh, takes up a series of tragic parts from plays that Euripides had written, uh, only some of which still survive. Um, but this becomes really the sort of central component of the escape plan uh, is like, Nasilicus takes inspiration, for instance, from uh, a play where the protagonist writes, basically sends a, a message in a bottle by writing on oars and setting them adrift on the ocean. Uh, Nasilicus writes on uh, some... Uh, Was it? Um, votive, sorry, votive slabs. Uh, some some things that that would be used to uh, carve prayers on for offerings, and he I don't know chucks them basically <laughs> in the hope that they will get to Euripides. Uh, he later decides that he's going to be Helen and uh, Euripides will be Menelaus and will come rescue him. Uh, he later decides that uh, he's going to be uh, these different characters, and, and Euripides sort of plays against this. So you've got these two guys acting out, typically the, these love stories, these sort of romantic relationships, where uh, a hero comes and rescues uh, a more or less worthy woman uh, when when uh, when it's Helen there's a question of how worthy she is but that's a separate separate issue um, and so that becomes the sort of crux of a lot of the action in the second half of the play is uh, Nasilicus and Euripides sort of playing these roles the other thing that I think is really interesting uh, in Thesmophoria Suze is that the women actually make really compelling, well, well-structured speeches. Um, so there's there's two women who mainly make speeches, um, and then Basilicus makes a speech as well. Um, 
But the first woman condemned Euripides for revealing some of women's secrets, some of their sort of strategies for leading a better life and and sort of getting out from under their husband's thumbs. Because remember, Athens is by the standards of ancient Greek city-states, Athens was a pretty heavily patriarchal society. Um, in in city-states like Sparta, women actually had a lot more rights. And in Rome later on, women had many more rights. In, in Egypt, women had many more rights. Athens was very much a patriarchal society. Um, so, I'm going to read you just the first bit of this speech, I think, because it, it's a really actually quite a good speech. Uh, so the first woman says, "'Tis not from any feeling of ambition I rise to address you, ladies, but because I long have seen and inly burned to see the way Euripides insults us all. The really quite interminable scoffs this market gardener's son pours out against us. I don't believe that there's a single fault he's not accused us of. I don't believe that there's a single theater or stage but there he is, calling us double dealers, false, faithless, tippling, mischief-making gossips, a rotten set, a misery to men. Well, what's the consequence? The men come home looking so sour. Oh, we can see them peering in every closet, thinking friends are there. Upon my word, we can't do anything we used to do. He has made, he has made the men so silly. Suppose I'm hard at work upon some chaplet. Hey, she's in love with somebody. Suppose I chanced to drop a pitcher on the floor, and straightway tis, for whom was that intended? I warrant now for our Corinthian friend. Is a girl ill? Her brother shakes his head. The girl's complexion is not to my taste. Why, if you merely want to hire a baby and palm it off as yours, you've got no chance. They sit beside our very beds, they do. Then there's another thing. The rich old men who used to marry us are grown so shy we never catch them now. And all because Euripides declares the scandal monger. An old man weds a tyrant, not a wife. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, but you get the sense. This is classical oration in this very sort of efficient, effective uh, style that ancient Athenians perfected, really. Um, this is one of the foundations of Athenian democracy, is freedom of speech and the ability to use rhetoric to persuade. And we get that both from the first woman and from the second woman, who accuses Euripides of being anti-religious, or of, of denigrating the gods. Now this might seem somewhat incidental, but it's actually a really interesting gesture and if, if you watch my other videos on Aristophanes, you know that my in my reading of him, he is anti-democratic. But the fact that these women use rhetoric so effectively in this public space, this is a perfect enactment of what Athenian democracy was meant to do. It was the very effective use of well-crafted arguments to persuade listeners. And so even as Aristophanes is generally skeptical of democracy, I think here we have it enacted in some of its very best components.